Uh, I was asked uh, by the president of Historic New Harmony, Ralph Schwarz, uh, to go out there with him and take a look at New Harmony and uh, see if I would be interested in building uh, the Athenaeum or designing the Athenaeum for them. And first of all, New Harmony, if I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, it's in the southwestern corner of Indiana. Uh, the nearest uh, public transportation by air is Evansville, which is an hour's drive away. And you get off the plane in Evansville, and you have a, a you drive through this kind of flat uh, farmland, and you, I remember thinking the first time, am I in the right place? There can't be another town out here in this uh, sort of wilderness. And we finally came to New World Harmony, and it was an oasis in the middle of the, uh, of the farmlands. It's, it's a place that has never experienced the normal kind of suburban growth and sprawl, which exists as two small towns grow together and then you get a sort of strip development. I hope you thought they had a declining population until the revitalization. Well, uh, that, that's not true either, because up until recently, farming was the major industry. In 1824, when Robert Owen was there, there were 950 residents. Today, there's still 950 residents, not the same ones, of course, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, it's always remained about the same size. And uh, as such, it's quite fascinating because uh, it's not a place that has any one style. There are uh, a, a few interesting federal houses. There's a, a few interesting uh, Greek revival uh, houses. There's a, a wonderful Victorian houses. Uh, there's some reconstructed log cabins from the uh, uh, Parmenas period. Uh, there is a, a wonderful cast iron uh, uh, facade uh, one block long, which is Main Street. Uh, it, it has a lot of quality, but it's all divergent. There is no style that is present. Uh, but what is unique about it is that whatever there is that it's of quality was of its time and was meaningful when it was built of its time. And to build a, uh, a building that looks like the log cabins would be as ludicrous as building a, a, a pseudo-federal uh, building uh, at the same time. And so what uh, Historic New Harmony wanted, and I think quite appropriately, was a building that they could say was of its time, and yet would make reference to and acknowledge uh, somehow the history of New Harmony. The Athenaeum is a visitor center. It's a place where people come, see exhibits on the history of New Harmony, and see a film uh, on uh, uh, New Harmony's past, buy their tickets for the tour of the town, and begin their promenade uh, through the town. In some ways, it is an orientation center, not unlike Williamsburg, in the sense of orienting the visitor, who then goes out to see the houses from the different periods That's and the right. restoration. That's right. But unlike Williamsburg, uh, people don't dress up in costume and don't greet you at the door uh, uh, in a kind of uh, phony way of, this is the way it was. People live there and, uh, and uh, uh, work there, and it's a living, working community. Uh, and the purpose is to show how a historic community, uh, a community which has quite a rich history, uh, has a contemporary life which is as meaningful as uh, its, its past. And so this building, as a, a building of orientation, is a building in which one moves through it, sees exhibits, and also sees aspects of the town. It's on the edge of the Wabash River, and one uh, comes up through the center space and looks out and sees the river, sees the point at which one formally entered the town and came. The point of arrival was, uh, uh, after all, in the 1850s by boat uh, down the Wabash River, and this was the point at which people would enter New Harmony. And so the building is related both to that historic point as well as as you move through and climb up and go onto the roofs and uh, walk around and go through the theater and from back down the stairs and then down the ramp, it kind of propels you back into the town 
and uh, relates to the Roofless Church by Philip Johnson. It's on axis with that Roofless Church and the prow of the building points to the, to the, the top of the Roofless Church, uh, which happens to be a block away, as well as to the uh, 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 Orchard House, which is a, uh, an Owenite uh, structure and the, the, the cemetery next to it. So it makes, re and it makes reference to the natural setting. It's up on a podium because the Wabash River floods every year. And so this uh, porcelain paneled uh, uh, boatload of knowledge is sort of floating on uh, a New Harmony shore uh, as the river rises. Did you have the opportunity to select the site in that instance? Uh, no, I manipulated the site, but I didn't select the site. What does that mean? Well, the site, uh, like other sites with, which I've been uh, given, was a, a formerly a garbage dump. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, this is not the first time we built on a garbage dump. But it was a garbage dump. It was at the edge of the town. It was outside the historic limits of the town. And uh, there was an old foundation uh, that had been built a number of years ago uh, for a, uh, uh, a building that was never erected and originally they thought well maybe we'll just use that foundation and build on top of it. Fortunately as it turned out that foundation was decaying and we didn't have to do that and so we could move the building uh, to a, a, a different part of this open field. We had uh, to uh, conform to the, the wishes of the uh, 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 U.S. Department of uh, 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 Water and, uh, and build a podium in order to keep the building out of the water. Uh, and that helped us too because we then could have this sort of Acropolis-like setting. Uh, and uh, then the building sort of slopes down to the woods and to the water. So when I, say the manipulate the site, the when I say manipulate the site, what I mean is we could form the site uh, by the use of earth and, and moving of earth and uh, uh, we're allowed to keep the trees and, and uh, shape the trees and open the trees to, to get views to the water. You said you had to conform to the wishes of a uh, federal department. How about the wishes of the people that live there and how do they feel about the building now that it is there? Well, uh, I, everyone I've talked to loves it, but that just, uh, you know, excuse me, I only talked to the, the people that liked it. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, what's interesting is that, uh, you know, obviously as a building is, is under construction, we have the same thing here in New York, you know, uh, I walk along Madison Avenue now and see all of these buildings under construction and I have my view of uh, what they are and how they're going to affect our town. And uh, I'm very concerned about them, and I'm concerned about what they're, they're going to do to, to, to uh, the people who live here. What do you think and, they will, and, uh, if we can, can be discursive Harmony, for a moment? <laughs> and, and in New Harmony, it's even more so because this is the first new building in the last 20 years. So there's even more concern about what this new structure is and, and there is what it's going to like be. It. And there's nothing like it. Uh, Any place, anywhere around. Uh, so uh, there's a, every night when the workmen leave, the, the town's populace, uh, without much else to do, comes climbing up, up the gangplank to see what's happened that day. And, what it, it, and everyone is very skeptical about it. But when it finally opened and people came through it, and they, they, they were really very enthusiastic and, and, and received it very warmly. And what's interesting is that it's, it's really in the middle of nowhere. I mean, for anyone who goes there, you'll, you'll see that. I think it's well worth the trip. But New Harmony as a place is worth going to see. Uh, but the Midwest is very different. And I had no idea about how different it was until I had this opportunity to work there. Uh, and uh, distance is different than what we, the way in which we experience it here in the East. And, uh, uh, I learned a lot from, from, from this experience, and uh, I, I, I think we did the right thing. In honor of the dedication of the Athenaeum, you involved your own talents in a new medium, and that is the exacting art of hand lithography. As I recall, that cast iron structure on Main Street is also an art gallery, and the man who runs that art gallery is also a fine printer. How did that collaboration come about? Well, it was very interesting because I'd never done a lithograph before, and I thought, you know, when well, you make a lithograph, you make a drawing and someone prints it. You know, there's nothing to it. Uh, there's a young uh, lithographer who runs a gallery, as you pointed out, and 
he gave me all these big metal plates and he said, okay, make a drawing and, and we'll do a lithograph. So I made a drawing and he said, well, is that all you want to do? And he gave me six more plates. So I made six more drawings which get overlaid and he went and got some people in central Indiana to make the paper uh, and we made a print. It only took two years. Uh, but it was a learning experience for me and a, a very uh, wonderful one because of the way in which uh, a group of people came together and, and uh, I really didn't know very much about the whole process before I began. I, I know a little bit about it now. Do you plan to do it again? I do, yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, hopefully uh, Frank and I are going to do a lithograph together. Uh, but As we'll part see. of that collaborative we'll, we'll project? We'll see. We'd like to encourage you to do so. Yeah, because he's, he's, he's making some absolutely beautiful, uh, Frank Stella is making some absolutely, this is just an aside, but he's really making some absolutely beautiful lithographs right now. Uh, the most beautiful lithographs I've ever seen. Have you ever collaborated with an architect with you as the artist? No. Would that ever occur to you to do? I've never had that occasion. Uh, but. Uh, who knows? Anything's possible. Um, among the buildings that you have not built is one that is so, it's so striking, the omission to me, and that is any, at least in this country, any uh, building to house the fine arts. Is that the kind of commission that would interest you? Well, Actually, uh, I've done a number of projects, uh, one in Florence for, for a museum, uh, which was uh, also a renovation, uh, uh, taking the stables of the Villa Strozzi and uh, uh, making a new museum into that. But I did have the opportunity, and, and also I did a room in, in, in the Guggenheim Museum, uh, uh, which is a small reading room, about half the size of the stage. Uh, but. Uh, I also had the opportunity of doing an exhibition, which was really a museum within the muse a museum in Albany, where, uh, which was for an exhibition called New York, the State of the Art, in which, uh, as a part of the Albany Mall, some of you may be familiar with it, there is a, a, a large uh, cultural center building. And within that building, there is a 40,000 square foot space, which has been sitting empty for about two or three years. Uh, I designed uh, for a, a special exhibition uh, a museum installation uh, for New York School uh, Painting and Sculpture, uh, which was there two years ago. And unfortunately, because of the size and scale of the art, has never been able to travel. No. You might tell us what you did do with that 42,000 square feet of space that you had to play with. It's been said that the installation uh, was a an imposing presence that never intruded on the art. And much, as much was discussed about the installation as the art itself at the time, what did you do there? Well, these, I, I was very uh, close to the work that was being shown there. I mean, here we had all the people that I, when I grew up, were my heroes. Uh, you had Rothko and de Kooning and Pollock, and I would just go right down the line, and, and great pictures. So these were all really people of the street, people who worked in New York City, who really loved the city and, and uh, made New York uh, in the 50s uh, the center of art that it is today. So in a sense, the, the installation is a, is, a, is a metaphor for the city. There's streets, there are windows, there are there rooms, uh, there are buildings within and of course, we were lucky to have this, this huge, enormous uh, space to deal with so that we could make a, an installation which not only showed the art in, a, in an incredible way, but made a further statement about a kind of uh, city structure uh, within the building. It allowed windows so that one could see a work of art in an intimate setting and then look across and see another work of art in a distant way. And as you move through the space, not only were you able to see things close up on a one-to-one -one basis in a normal uh, gallery situation, but you were able to see things you had seen before in a different relationship to other works of art. It's much 
I mean, it's something which I learned from the Guggenheim Museum, where you see a work and then you go around to the other side of the ramp and then you look across and you see it differently. But fortunately, because of the spaces that I was dealing with, I could do it at another scale and make it much more intimate and didn't have to get into a kind of rotational situation. I think that's so interesting that you say that, Richard, because obviously in your installation, the installation itself accommodated itself to the art, and I think very few people would say that about the Guggenheim. In fact, going a step further, in, an, in, in response to an interview, you called the Guggenheim Museum the best work of architecture in the city. Was that during the course of the time you were working on the no. library facility? Did you believe that? Do you still believe that? Well, I... I... I still believe that, yes. Uh, if one's well, why do you like the building so much? Perhaps you tell well, us that. Well, I think that the, when you go into that space, the Guggenheim Museum, there's a, uh, that space has an uplifting quality, which is absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, I happen to think that good works of art look good in the Guggenheim Museum, and bad works of art fall apart there. Uh, that things hold their own, and they have to really have a strength and a power and a poignancy. That there's certain kinds of things that group shows, I don't think work well in the Guggenheim Museum. I think a good one-man show does work well, and that you can see it, and you can see it again and again, uh, and uh, it does need a kind of unified uh, theme, such as a one-man show, to hold up. The Calder show that was there was absolutely exquisite. Uh, the Boyce show, I am not, I do not happen to be a, 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 a strong proponent of Boyce, but I thought that that Boy show had an incredible power and a, a wonderful presence, and I really had a sense of voice in that building and the way in which it was shown in that building that I don't think uh, would have held up any place else uh, in the same way. Uh, but when you go into the, that building and you go into that space, there's an un uplifting quality that I don't think any other space in New York City has. And I've often said that, you know, someday, it, it, and this is a little bit facetious, of course, but someday, you know, that building may not e even be any longer a, a place to show painting and sculpture, and it'll still be a great building as far as I'm concerned. So you think it is the greatest piece of outdoor sculpture as well? No, it's not outdoor sculpture. It's a work of architecture. In this pluralistic moment in architecture, is there any building that you haven't built that you would like to? All the buildings I have, I've designed and haven't built I'd like to, but there's a funny thing. Uh, as an architect, you learn that you really put all your energy into the thing that you're working on at that particular moment in time. And you really think that that is the thing that is important, and then you either build that or you don't build that, and you go on to the next thing, and that is what is important. But as I look back, and uh, since I've been sitting here, I mean, one of the reasons that I, I, I did the book on my work when I did it was out of a certain frustration of having designed so many buildings and having done the working drawings and getting them to the point where they could begin construction and then because of the economic situation in the early 70s uh, so many of the buildings were not built and they were simply models and drawings and this disappointment uh, was enormous for me at, at that time, it still is. But as I look back, I couldn't say that's the building I would want to build or that's the building I would want to build. Uh, at the time when they didn't go ahead, uh, uh, I felt you know, a great sense of loss. Uh, and it's, it, it hurts because you work and you work for a year or two years or three years and your work is, is almost finished and it's really up then to someone else to execute it. Uh, but that's the point at which it becomes expensive for the client because the, the building cost is, is what uh, it really matters. The architect's fees are, are minuscule. Uh, uh, and that's the point at which many things stop. And you realize that you've spent all of this time and this energy and this commitment uh, and a, a certain point of your life is taken and put into that building and the, the, the fact that the building isn't realized uh, is, is, is an enormous disappointment. What's the most important thing for us to know about your work? Uh, boy, 
the world? It's a good question. I would say that, as I pointed out earlier, uh, my thoughts and my concerns really have to do with space and light and the ways in which one manipulates them. And it's something which I think I pursue with a kind of uh, direction or uh, perseverance in, in terms of the quality of the space. And that's really what uh, the what what concerns me the most, and, and that is to get the maximum quality in any uh, situation that is humanly possible. For raising the high art of architecture with your usual light and clarity in such an especially moving way uh, to a new dimension, thank you, Richard Meyer, for being with us tonight, and thank you, audience, too. Thank you.